If you really look at how our society interacts today, it's the last gathering place where we get together in large numbers and celebrate something together in person. It's always been around community, right? It's a community of fans. It's a community of people that root for the team that you root for. And the idea that we have is how can we combine that, if you will, with the sort of more technology-driven community and the expectations that our, our guests, our fans have around that community. It's a once-in-a-life opportunity. You don't get to build a stadium every day. Building a stadium of this size, this shape, it might happen only once in your lifetime. It, it's truly amazing. So we broke ground on the project at SoFi Stadium in, in late November of 2016. Since that time, we've had over 13,000 workers step foot on this project, all working very hard to, to open the building in July of 2020. The stadium is classified as an open-air stadium. The idea was always from the architects to build something that felt uniquely California. SoFi Stadium is really the front porch to Los Angeles. We're located right under the flight path at LAX. And so as you're coming into Los Angeles from all over the world, this 300 acres of land is really your first impression to Los Angeles. Certainly the building itself, not the curvature of the roof, is unlike anything else uh, in all of sports in terms of the fifth dimension, that fifth elevation that people can look down and experience Hollywood Park, which I think is, is an incredible experience. So we have a canopy system that covers the field. It reduces the UV from the sun coming in, moderating the temperature in the bowl, and it protects us from rain, and so we can have 365 days a year events here. On top of the roof, we will string LED light engines. Think of them as a single pixel. And the pixels are basically laid out on a five foot by five foot grid. And that grid has about 20,000 of these LED light engines that we can project content on top of the roof. Some of the constraints that you have to deal with in modern buildings like this is that they're just more technology dense. And so some of the things that we had to do was to review our designs, making sure that everything we were doing here was future proof. We're really proud of the design and the construction of the Oculus just because of the scale of it. It's 110 yards long, it's the height of a four-story building, it's about 2.2 million pounds. It has all of the audio, all the amplification, and then all of the 5G wireless antennas into it. And we are going to suspend that from the roof. The building itself is owned and developed by Stan Kroenke and, and his vision for this building, but also the entire 300-acre project at Hollywood Park, is it's, it's really a generational investment in the community of Inglewood and Los Angeles, and it needs to last for 100 years. And that's everything that we give in terms of thoughtfulness and, and workmanship and materials uh, has that in mind. Qatar won the right to host the 2022 FIFA World Cup in 2010. So we start designing, we start planning for technology 10 years ago. The country itself wants to economically diversify from having a focus on oil and gas. And we're hoping that stadiums will offer that for the area and the surrounding areas of, of the stadiums. We believe that uh, this tournament will be a catalyst to boost the business across the world and bridge the cultural gap between the East and West. 
Well, we came up with the design with the collaboration with Zaha Hadid. The design was uh, representing the Dao ship, which has been used in Al-Wakra and Lokir uh, cities for the pair diving before. Qatar, when we started the bid, we put a lot of science behind the design of stadiums because we promised air-conditioned stadiums, stadiums that can work 24-7 during the day, irrespective of whatever environment you have outside. And this changed how we design stadiums. What are the three elements for a beautiful game? Number one, the players, the fans, and the grass. We are creating an invisible bubble with a small layer, is about two meters high. So the, uh, the way we deliver cooling air now, we're using some small air dispensers, if you like. And you can see we have zones, and under each zone we have a, a little sensor that monitors the whole environment, and it can increase or decrease the airflow, depends on what is the temperature on the region. Uh, we use these nozzles as well, and that jet will go and seep the cold air through the field of play, and I will start to build a very nice cool layer of cold air up to two meters where players can play in a safe environment. Every stadium has its own characteristics. This stadium is constructed on three tiers. The upper tier, the third tier, is the demountable tier. So that tier is basically kind of a scaffold system that could be demounted at any time. The number of seats will be reduced from 40,000 to 20,000. Education City in its entirety is one of the flagship projects of Qatar Foundation. Everything that we do is focused around unlocking the human potential. So whether it's strictly in education, whether it's strictly in the research field, uh, or the community where we have things like debating programs, sports programs. And so we do a lot to provide that opportunity to make sure people are coming in and enjoying. Wasa Babud Stadium is uh, the first stadium to be fully demountable. It will be built like a big Lego piece. It will be like steel structures that is being built right now and then eventually containers will be put together and put in the stadium for the duration of the World Cup. al Bayt, it's an Arabic name, means home. The design is inspired by the heritage, the culture, the hospitality of Qatar, of the Arab nation. It's the it's Arabian Bedouin tent. The retractable roof has been built by using 18 trusses of big steel structure. We use a special membrane called Tenara. The whole stadium is air-conditioned, so having the roof closed, you can do what we call pre-cooling, so you start the air-conditioning system for two hours, you cool the whole stadium, and then you can open the roof, enjoy a football match in the middle of the summer in a temperature that's very comfortable for people inside the stadium. Wi-Fi is not about the coverage, it's about the coverage and the capacity. You want to serve a Wi-Fi capacity to more than 70,000 people. The stadium will provide 5G technology. You have to make sure that legacy-wise it is fully optimized and you don't have any white elephants. And, and that's why every stadium has its own business plan, what to do with it after uh, the World Cup. And at the same time, is we made sure that the, the stadium will be 24-7 functional hubs uh, for, for the community. Qatar 2022, it will be a different experience for the whole of the world to come and experience Arab culture, Qatari culture in a different way that uh, everybody will be happy about. As a Qatari and, and as the state of Qatar, sports is, is very much part of our DNA. Everyone gets to enjoy and benefit from our facilities and that means we need to be open, inclusive and accessible. San Francisco is an amazing cultural place. We've never had a world-class sports and entertainment arena, and we conceived a building that would play on a world stage. For us, it was really important that this building be discussed in the same conversation with Madison Square Garden in New York or the O2 in London. And our vision was, while we wanted it to be reflective of the Bay Area community, we wanted it to play on a bigger stage. In 2015, when I first got here, I started planning the, the design for the infrastructure. Before the first cement was poured, we had already planned the entire, close to one million square feet of this place from a technology perspective. Inside of there, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility that we have that we can 
implement newer technology and at least in a pilot or test type of phase, we can try it out and uh, fully implement it if it is working. You know, as we are creating this experience, we're very cognizant that we're here in, in Silicon Valley, we're here in the Bay Area, and there there is a tremendous set of expectations that comes with that. And then how do we take advantage of everything that's around us here to really make that happen? We want the experience to happen at the very edge of the property line, not necessarily inside the arena, but literally as they drive up or walk up to the property and really kind of get the full breadth of, wow, this is an amazing, immense facility. The stadium is great. I mean, it's very high tech. Uh, I love just the openness of the promenade and, and the plaza areas. And it's state of the art. Everything is fresh. Everything is brand new. You know, for me tonight, it's just about the experience. I'm in the nosebleed section, so I'm trying to see maybe if this technology can wow me and make my experience worth it being all the way at the top. So I don't know what kind of lights, camera actions I'm going to see, but I hope it's fantastic. When you walk into the Chase Center, the signage, the, the amount of it really draws you right in to whatever feeling they're trying to portray. And, you know, in a modern stadium, LED as a visual medium is king. Just a few years ago in a typical NBA stadium, you might put up a total of 15 or 20 signs. I think at Chase, we're over 100. You know, one of the great things about most technologies is it's completely measurable. I think one of the values that we play is we can, we can be a much more data-driven organization based on how people use our technology. So we designed this system where the school board actually completely retracts into the ceiling, gantries close underneath it, and that giant scoreboard that I saw last night at the Warriors game is nowhere to be found when I come to a concert the next night. Our ability to collect thousands of points of data, right, and, and aggregate that data and understand, you know, where do fans go, right, on a regular basis. And you can almost visualize in your mind a sort of heat map. And that certainly can be to the benefit of the fan in terms of things like safety and security, but it can also be to the benefit of the franchise in terms of better merchandising. What we see happening in the world, right, in every aspect of this is like people want to curate their own experience, right? and. The more things we can have on the opportunity list for people to do that, I think the more personalized their experience will feel and the more rewarding it'll be. But you also have to even think about and budget for constant renewal. A friend of mine used to say that uh, we're like a theme park. You should have a new ride, uh, a new reason for people to come every year. And I kind of like that approach. Like, what are we going to do next season that is something different and new than we've done the season before that gives somebody a fresh outlook when they come there or a new thing to discover? And just know that this process never ends. If we're going to remain as relevant as we are today, we have to change with it.